You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. What does it mean to live a good life? There are a paralyzing array of possible answers to this question. In classical times, the Stoics taught that a good life came from peace of mind. Their contemporaries, the Epicureans, believed that it was caused by an abundance of pleasure. Zoom forward to the 19th century, and you have the utilitarians believing that the goodness comes from seeking the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. German philosopher Immanuel Kant, in contrast, held that goodness could be achieved only by following strict personal moral rules. How do we know which school is correct? Is it the effects of a person's actions that determine whether they are good or bad? Or is it the intention behind those actions that really counts? Or is goodness something relative that can only be defined in reference to each individual? All of these questions have been studied tirelessly over the last 2,000 years. Today, they can be studied by anyone searching for an answer. However, when Aristotle wrote his Nicomachean Ethics in the 4th century BCE, this was not the case. Among earlier Western philosophers, nobody had ever written a comprehensive treatise on the subject. Plato and the pre-Socratic philosophers had commented on specific ethical dilemmas, but there was no work that focused exclusively on what it means to be a good person and what it means to live a good life. Trying to fill this gap, Aristotle was not looking for an abstract, timeless, platonic form of theoretical goodness. Rather, Nicomachean ethics was his attempt to determine what concrete goodness is in practice. The title of the book comes from Aristotle's son, Nicomachus. It was dedicated to his moral education. While it's true that there were no works dedicated solely to ethical philosophy prior to it, it's not as if people were living in a moral vacuum. Aristotle's world was filled with ethical opinions derived from history, religion, and tradition. However, these values were often inconsistent and tended to vary over time and from place to place. Aristotle believed that there is a universal goodness that can be known and achieved and that is based on timeless truths rather than circumstances. To find it, he had to start from first principles. In Nicomachean Ethics, he sought to answer the question, what does it mean to live a good life, almost as if it had never been answered before. In this book insight, we'll follow Aristotle as he attempts to create a definition of goodness from the ground up. Then, we'll discuss the ways in which most people fail to attain a truly good life. Lastly, we'll go over how to achieve a good life through rational, virtuous activity aimed at a golden mean. We'll end by reflecting on the book's legacy. For now, we'll start by defining goodness from the ground up. Before trying to figure out how to live a good life, you must have a definition of what goodness is. Since Aristotle decided to begin the Nicomachean Ethics by disavowing all previous concepts of goodness, this definition had to come from first principles. In order to define human goodness, he asks a fundamental question. What is the end towards which all of our actions reach? If each and every action has a goal, what ultimately is the final goal of each of those intermediate goals? Ask yourself why you made a recent decision. Why did you decide to listen to this book insight? Most likely, you want to learn more about the Nicomachean Ethics. But why did you want to learn more about the Nicomachean Ethics? Because you want to educate yourself. You want to educate yourself because of the various benefits that being an educated person provides. And you want these benefits because they make you happier compared to how you might feel if you lack them. No matter what the intermediate steps are, the end goal of action is eudaimonia. This loosely translates as happiness, but can also mean doing well, 
success, or flourishing. Here is the Ayn Rand Institute lead instructor, Leonard Peikoff, discussing eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is broader than simply the emotional level. It implies successful living on all levels, not merely emotional enjoyment, but successful action, unimpeded thinking, in general living, functioning, acting successfully. A good life is one in which you achieve your goals. And as all goals can ultimately boil down to happiness, so happiness and the good life are synonymous. Happiness is the key to a good life for three reasons. It is desirable in itself, it doesn't derive its desirability from being a means to another goal, and all other good acts and feelings are desirable if and only if they contribute to happiness. While you may enjoy honor, pleasure, or wealth, each of these subordinate goals is only desirable if it leads to happiness. If any of these intermediate goals ceases to lead to happiness, they should no longer be pursued. If, on the other hand, you're becoming more educated to impress your peers, or if you're eating well past the point of satisfying hunger, the end of these actions may not be happiness. If you spend your entire life working to maximize your salary, but all of the money you earn isn't making you happy, then your strategy is failing. Knowing that all actions should be aimed at leading to happiness is not enough, because many don't in practice. But how can you know whether a certain action will lead towards happiness or unhappiness? Aristotle answers that you must become educated in virtue. Ethical virtues such as temperance and courage are primarily developed in childhood through parenting. In later life, they evolve through contemplation, reflection, and development of good habits. Intellectual virtues, on the other hand, such as art, science, and wisdom, are best developed through formal education. Ethically and intellectually virtuous actions lead to a good life. Aristotle believed that these two types of virtues could only be fully developed by the Athenian upper class. He believed that slaves, commoners, and women were incapable of true happiness. Fortunately, there is nothing in his argument that has any basis beyond the preconceptions of his time. While it's true that a person's circumstances may make a good life harder to achieve, it's not impossible. Since it is rational, virtuous action that leads to happiness, not wealth or honor or some other subordinate good, specific circumstances are challenges not absolute impediments. It's important to note that Aristotle's key to happiness is virtuous action, not the mere existence of virtue. It's not enough to sit alone at home calling yourself brave, generous, and kind while not actually performing any brave, generous, or kind acts. It's the result of your actions and practice that lead to goodness and happiness, not a virtuous state of being. Virtue ethics in itself was by no means a new development in the time of Aristotle. Bravery, honor, and cleverness were well established as virtuous by the Homeric epics and often held to be the keys to living a good life. Where the Nicomachean ethics changed things is through its injection of careful, calculated reason. Instead of being left to mere instinct or noble intentions, the good life could be created one conscious action at a time. As Aristotle put it, we become builders by building, and we become harpists by playing the harp. Similarly then, we become just by doing just actions, temperate by doing temperate actions, brave by doing brave actions. Happiness then comes from expressing what we have rationally decided is good for us over the long term. Happiness isn't pleasure, but a byproduct of a meaningful life. Let's break for now. Before we go, let's recap what we've learned from Nicomachean ethics so far. Aristotle defines happiness as an ends where you achieve all your goals. It's the secret behind all motivation. To be sure of a happy life, you must learn virtues. This way you can avoid unhappy misdirections. Virtuous action leads to a continued virtuous path in life. When we return, we'll cover the ways people fail to attain a virtuous life. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. 
There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our look into Nicomachean ethics. The ancient text was written by Aristotle and dedicated to his son, Nicomachus. Previously, we've learned that a happy life is one where we complete all our goals, and only knowing and practicing virtue will ensure us of a happy end. This time, we'll look into how people fail to attain a truly good life. The virtuous life is not so easy, and many people fail to live in accordance with it. The simplest and rarest of these types of people are those that Aristotle calls evil. The evil are not people who are ignorant or unaware, nor do they live in such poor circumstances as to make virtuous action very difficult. Aristotle understands that a good action must be voluntary and deliberate. Acting poorly due to circumstances beyond one's control is not the same as voluntarily acting with ill intent. Evil people understand the consequences of their actions. Due to favoring certain pleasures above goodness, they voluntarily and deliberately choose to act in opposition to virtue. They respond in excess when moderation is called for, or may do nothing when action is required. An evil person might, for example, ignore the virtue of temperance in favor of a life of excess pleasure, or they may act with a defiance of justice by being quick to anger at any perceived slight. Here's Ayn Rand Institute instructor Leonard Pykoff again discussing these evil persons. Wicked men seek for people with whom to spend their days and shun themselves, for they remember many a grievous deed and anticipate others like them when they are by themselves, but when they are with others, they forget, and having nothing lovable in them, they have no feeling of love to themselves. These types of people may feel happy while acting, but Aristotle believes that the happiness of a person acting out of sync with rational virtue is illusory and temporary. This is because the evil person has desires of a nature that cannot ever be completely satisfied. Their happiness is like a bucket of water with a small hole at the bottom. They do things to make themselves happy, but the source of their happiness is in no way everlasting. It's temporary. Slowly but surely, the water drains. Life becomes an unending quest to fulfill unfulfillable desires. On this measure, the evil person can't be seen as happy. Their life of excess and deficiency will necessarily lead them to an unbalanced life. Think, for example, of the rich businessman who spends his adult life doing deals day and night, chasing the big bucks. All the while, he fails to enjoy his children growing up and neglects his wife. In time, he gets everything he wanted, but only in one part of his life. Failure in the other parts adds up to a failure in total. As such, Aristotle points out anyone living deliberately ignorant of rational virtue will be unable to lead a good life. Often, we can only assess whether we've led a good life at the end of it. For many, this is far too late. A more common form of failed life is what Aristotle termed a life of acrasia. This term has been variously translated as having weak will, lacking command, or incontinence, meaning an absence of self-restraint. Unlike an evil person, an incontinent person is one who recognizes that their bad actions are not virtuous, but for one reason or another, falls into temptation and makes poor decisions. An incontinent person's actions can be explained by an imbalance between reason and passion. To use a modern example, when on the road, another car suddenly cuts you off. Even though you understand that nothing can be gained from retaliating, you allow anger to overcome reason. Your subsequent act of road rage comes about not due to evil intent, but due to lack of self-control. Had reason prevailed, you would now be happy. Instead, you live in regret. Impetuousness is another cause of incontinence. It is not the result of deliberation, but rather an unchecked desire for pleasure. 
when making a bad decision, there is no internal conflict involved. You want something, so you take it. In the moment, this might not be seen as a good or bad decision, just an attempt to satisfy your impulses. Only afterwards do the immediate and long-term results of these actions emerge. Both lack of self-discipline and impetuousness are caused by a lack of reason. Aristotle emphasizes the value of calculated decision-making and always thinking things through. There is a third type of suboptimal life that Aristotle groups with the evil and the incontinent. This type of person faces the same temptations as the incontinent person, but more often than not decides to act in accordance with virtue. In Greek, Aristotle calls this a life of enkratia. Literally, this word is translated as in command, but is often called self-control, mastery, or continence. The continent person goes through the same internal conflict as the incontinent person, but instead decides to act in accordance with virtue. They have passions that attempt to influence their actions, but they understand that the right decision sometimes goes against these passions. They make the correct choice despite them. On the face of it, the continent life may seem like a good life. From a consequentialist perspective, it seems that there is no difference between a person who is tempted toward negative actions but acts virtuously and one who acts virtuously without temptation. But Aristotle says the inner struggle that the continent person faces leads to a conflict between their emotions and their rational thought. They recognize the correct response but are inwardly resistant to it. This might not seem like a big deal, but the dichotomy creates unhappiness. Of course, all of us make decisions that Aristotle would call evil, incontinent, and continent at various points in our lives. You're probably what Aristotle would call continent most of the time. You generally make ethical decisions, even if you have an inner struggle leading you in other directions. You do more good than harm. But a continent life is not the ideal life and does not lead to true happiness. Over time, the unhappiness of the merely continent person will lead to non-virtuous actions. Eventually, passion and desire will override reason. This may not happen in every single case, but it is impossible for a person who ignores or fights their desires to act virtuously 100% of the time. Therefore, though far superior to the lives of evil and incontinence, the continent person will not be optimally happy. Let's break one final time before we end. But first, let's go over what we've learned from Nicomachean ethics this time. Living a virtuous life can be extremely challenging. We've learned that evil people live with a hole in their heart. They'll never have enough and they'll never be complete. Similarly, there are also incontinent people. These types live with weak self-control. Both of these personalities fail to achieve a happy life. The virtuous should strive to become in command or master their impulses. Otherwise, they fall into passions and impulses and become either evil or incontinent. We'll wrap up next time by defining the golden mean. Then we'll end with discussing the book's legacy. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our discussion on Nicomachean ethics. It's comprised of ancient teachings by Aristotle. Last time, we went over the reasons people fail to live a happy, virtuous life. Now, we'll learn how people succeed at doing so. We'll discover how Aristotle's golden mean plays into a happy life. Then we'll end by reflecting on the book's legacy. So, what kind of virtue or character does lead to happiness? Happiness will not come from blind virtue alone. Bravery, for example, is undeniably admirable, 
but being rash may cause a person to harm themselves and others unnecessarily. Timidity is not much better. Rashness and timidity represent the excess and deficiency of the virtue of bravery. For Aristotle, the key to the best life is an intermediate between excess and deficiency. Though he does not use the term itself, this midpoint has become known in Aristotelian studies as the golden mean. Here's Ayn Rand Institute instructor Pykoff one more time. We can take any human action or emotion and distinguish three amounts on a scale. The too much, the too little, and the just right. The golden mean. Virtuous behavior will always be the golden mean between the two extremes. The golden mean is highly variable and depends on the actor. For example, what is brave for an average person might be cowardly for a particularly strong person. Likewise, the golden mean changes in response to the situation that prompts it. For example, it might be appropriate to react to a meaningless insult with no anger. A real threat, on the other hand, might require some amount of anger as a response to frighten off the enemy. The golden mean is about responding appropriately. When hungry, you could decide to gorge yourself until you can't stand the sight of food, or you could ignore your desires completely and decide not to eat. But neither of these extremes will lead to happiness. Rather, the desire should be satisfied in proportion to its strength. One should eat enough to regain equilibrium, not more and not less. The variability of the golden mean can be taken to extremes. Aristotle holds that even an action that would be normally considered morally repugnant can be considered to be the right action under certain circumstances. Killing, for example, is nearly universally wrong, but may be justified if it's done in self-defense or to protect the lives of others. An appropriate reaction begins with a deep understanding of the self. It also requires an understanding of society as well as the effect that your actions will have on society. An action may seem good in isolation, but if it causes the scorn of society and leads you to being an outcast, the action is ultimately unwise. In many cases, actions that benefit society as a whole tend to be the most beneficial. In most situations, everyone knows the right thing to do, but it is important to realize that mistakes and bad decisions happen. In a difficult moral dilemma, a wrong choice doesn't make you a bad person. What is important is that you take a step back, attempt to reach an understanding of what happened, and use it to improve yourself in the future. Aristotle's pleasing conclusion is that happiness is not predetermined by fate. It can be acquired through a virtuous life of work, application, or study. We shouldn't judge a person's life according to their ups and downs, but by their enduring virtues that they develop and express. This is the real measure of success. Let's have a quick recap. According to Aristotle, the good life is one where reason is taken into account at all levels. One should act with the appropriate balance of virtue rather than live a life of unrestrained action or bland asceticism. Pleasure should not be ignored, nor should they control one's life entirely. Unlike an evil person, a person living in accordance with the golden mean will make decisions that lead to lasting happiness, not just short-term pleasure. Unlike an uninhibited person, they will not be ruled by their passions despite their knowledge of true goodness. And unlike an inhibited person, they will not be overwhelmed by their inner conflict, fighting their own desires each and every day. The person who follows the golden mean can rise above each of these three types of flawed lives to reach genuine happiness. The key to doing so is reflection and constant revision of your habits. With these tools, you can avoid the thought patterns that plague the three bad lives and start to make decisions that lead towards happiness. But when things go wrong, bear in mind that it's not the end of the world. Rather, these setbacks are opportunities to use the past to learn, improve, and grow. Given that the Nicomachean Ethics is the original Western work on the philosophy of ethics, it's remarkable that it's still relevant to modern life. 
For instance, Aristotle recognizes that pleasure is not an absolute negative, but often a necessary component of a happy life. Yet by focusing on the power of reason, he avoids some of the moral tone of Stoics like Epictetus and Seneca. Rather than providing an absolute moral code, the proper action in each circumstance is contingent upon the individual. What is just, courageous, or temperate for one person is not the same as what those virtues would be for any other person. That said, Aristotle doesn't take his relativism nearly as far as modern thinkers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. He assumes that there is a set of timeless virtues which we should all try to measure up to, such as courage, justice, or temperance. The best life is one of happiness, and happiness can be best achieved by rational actions in accordance with balanced virtue. Happiness is not a life of pleasure, nor a life of pure virtuous service to others, but rather it's somewhere in between. Aristotle said, and just as Olympic prizes are not for the finest and strongest, but for the contestants, since it is only these who win, the same is true in life. Among the fine and good people, only those who act correctly win the prize. In other words, there is no great mystery to achieving moral success and worldly happiness. They are two sides of the same coin. This remarkably rational approach to human flourishing still holds true. Anyone could live in accordance to Aristotle's ethical philosophy, even in today's modern society. For a book that's 2400 years old, that is really saying something. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice.